Uh, what does it mean? Uh, uh, losing the pain, the pain has gone. And it seemed to be forever. And then uh, the pain came back. And uh, time later, uh, joy, joy comes too. And uh, they stayed together. So is this uh, an endless circle like, uh, like the sand circle with an open end? It's valuable, as you have said, huh? to be able to let go of the pain. But this is not in itself the goal of practice. Uh, Gotama Buddha in the Pali Suttas, not some Zen story, but in the early old Pali Suttas, it clearly states that he had great pain when he was dying. He had uh, eaten some bad food, was already old and ill, and uh, he had food poisoning at the end of his life. It even says he had diarrhea. <laughs> Imagine that, <laughs> the all enlightened one, diarrhea, yep, and pain. It says in the sutta, unless he sat deeply enough in that uh, concentrated dhyana, dhyana is the Sanskrit word for Zen. Unless he sat deeply enough, his body still experienced pain. Yes, that's right. He could, Werner, you can relate to this, huh? He could, sit deeply enough and enter a deep enough state so that there is no pleasure, joy, or pain. There is no experience like that of pleasure or pain. This can be really valuable when you're going to the dentist, Werner. <laughs> it can also be valuable in sustained zazen but it is not the goal of the practice. What then is the goal of the practice? It is to be free, even from the need to be free of pain. Do you see, Werner? Yes. There's a place for pain. It's our body telling us something is wrong. <laughs> Big, no big deal. Respect it. Listen to it. Do what needs to be done. But we have a body. So we will have pleasure. <laughs> and we will have pain. As long as we have a body and a mind. Yes. That's not the problem, is it, Werner? No. to sit through and confirm in your bones, not just in your mind as a temporary state that we go into an atom, no, to confirm in your bones. This is free, even from freedom from pain. I don't even have to hold on to that. <laughs> pain is not a problem. It's the suffering, dukkha, the dis-ease, isn't it? You see? Yeah. Even when you have pleasure, when you have joy, what does the self do? <gasps> I want to keep this. <laughs> We're already creating distress, dis-ease, aren't we? In the midst of our joy, because we're clinging to it, 
already the seeds of that disease are there. Hmm? That's why dukkha, the first noble truth of Buddhism, is spoken of as universal. It's not just about, oh, when I'm in pain. No. Dukkha is, in a profound sense, just as present when you're feeling pleasure. Do you see, Werner? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say anything else? I'm sure your question uh, strikes to the heart of many others as well. Do you want to say anything else? No, thank you. If anyone else would like to speak up from their experience, please feel free. It's about a... Um... I have the, the question. My question is, if really ev everything I do, if I'm uh, cooking or cleaning or, or going for a walk or uh, something else, or something email writing or whatever, uh, is this, if I do it really, is this all helpful to, uh, to come to the truth? Don't create your own hindrances. You understand, Barbara? Is writing an email a hindrance? <laughs> Is it? Mm. Is it? No. Is it? Should not, should, it should not be, no. It should not be. <laughs> <laughs> Consider well, Barbara. What are you doing? What are you doing? Is an email bad? Oh, no. <laughs> oh. Uh, I hate to tell you, but none of us would be here without email. <laughs> it's not the email that is the hindrance, Barbara. Do you see what your mind is doing? Do you? Mm. Uh, I try. <laughs> mm. Think about it. Sit with your body. How else can you sit? <laughs> sit with your whole body and confirm this, huh? Hmm? Do you step out of this when you do an email? If you do, it just shows your practice is not yet mature. Do you step out of this when you step in dog shit on the street? Hmm? Okay. With your brand new shoes, maybe? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Can you step out of this, Barbara? Uh, I understand, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to understand, but it's a good beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Again, it's not just yours, Barbara. You were talking on uh, Friday a lot about patience. Could you talk a bit more about patience, please? I'm getting a little impatient with that. <laughs> um, what do you want me to say? <laughs> For me, when you were talking about patience, it was very helpful. Hmm. Because I'm, I'm, when I'm sitting, I'm often in impatience. And uh, yes. Yes, well, I've, I, I, know, I know that experience very well. Um, what are you waiting for? There is your delusion. Do you see? Hmm? What are you waiting for? Hmm? You might want to be a little impatient with that one, huh? 
What are you waiting for? I'm asking. Hmm? Hmm? Some more perfect state, some deeper samadhi, some kinsho. What are you impatient about? Hmm? You want the sitting to be over? <laughs> you want the next sitting to begin? <laughs> what are you waiting for? This? It's already here. You must see what your mind is doing. Hmm? Yeah. Do you want to say anything else? No, but all you said, I'm waiting for, so yes. Okay. Yes. See it. See it through. See it through. You're waiting for what? You're waiting for this. <laughs> Maybe it's good to be a little impatient. <laughs> mm. See what your mind is doing, and it's already almost completely undone. But as long as you keep chasing your tail, yep, patient, impatient, Do you want to say anything else? Your last sentence was, it's, it's already everything is undone. I, I, I don't understand. Savor it. Savor it. That's the end of your question about patience. Huh? Right here and right now. Everything is undone. If you don't understand, fine. Sit through until you do. You don't have to go anywhere else. <laughs> hmm? Right here, right now, patient or impatient. Right here, right now, everything is undone. It will be, it is undone. That's why we can speak this way. That's why life is what it is. That is what is real, if you like to call it that. Huh? That is being without form, without self. Here and now, as the person that you are. Clear enough? Yes. Thank you again. That question, I'm sure, strikes the heart of many. Thank you. So I was wondering if, when going back to the world, uh, compassion can help in maintaining practice. The practice of compassion can help in maintaining practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I didn't uh, use the word enough compassion, but you can see, I trust, it's all compassion, isn't it? <laughs> hmm? that's, that's the amazing thing. When I first started practice, uh, compassion was in there as some kind of a vague idea. Yeah, you know, I can, I can dig that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I was in it for the enlightenment, for solving all of my many problems. But if you give yourself to the practice, it becomes clear soon enough. Huh? That initial resolve, what I spoke the other day, bodhicitta, the first rising of this 
We need to practice. That is compassion, isn't it? <laughs> that is compassion. It's not perfected, as we say in Buddhism yet. The perfection of compassion, that's okay. It's, it, it's getting there. But we see that the very first real need to practice, where does that come from? It comes from compassion, from love. It's that genuine need to be and love, be inseparable from the world. That is compassion. It is an end in a sense. Yes, you go back to the world, compassion must be working. Huh? But it's where you're coming from, W. Isn't it? It's where we are all coming from, not just where we're going to. And it's where we are standing right now. Love, compassion. Again, a very valuable question. Huh? Do we go home and find compassion? In a sense, I was suggesting that, but even more deeply, going home itself is the work of compassion. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your Thank question. If anyone else would like to speak up from their experience, please feel free. Yes, this is Egad. Um, hey, yes, please. Jeff. Um, yesterday you mentioned that uh, that you mentioned you mentioned when you accepted the pain and in, in sitting in the monastery, it then became a lot easier. Uh, now we all have problems with our body, but we all have also problems with our wavering mind. What's the difference in between those two problems? Hmm. There are two. Are they are they separate? Mm, not really. <laughs> I mean, the we can have physical pain. We can also have what we could call mental pain, agony, distress. Huh? Yes. I, I wouldn't say they are absolutely separable, separate, because we have a body we experience that pain in our body. That's why if we have some mental anguish or worry, it affects our body. We find our shoulders getting tight. You, you know, they're, they're not separate entities. Huh? There is the physical pain of the body and that can be tremendous. I, as I said uh, two days ago huh, in the Dharma talk, excruciating pain yes for some people it it's it's a excruciating extremely painful one sitting for others it's not so difficult it's not good it's not bad people have different bodies different pain thresholds as it said you know where it becomes really unbearable huh? We have bodies and we have minds. Yes, it'd be hard to awaken without them. <laughs> and this body and this mind experiences pain and pleasure. It's of its nature, it's of its nature. Hmm? Once again, what Buddhism is pointing to is not that pain or that pleasure. It is pointing to the dis-ease, the dukkha, the suffering that comes from having or being a self, the self-delusion. Do you follow? The physical body has pain. It should. It should. It's telling us something is wrong. Yes. And our mind can have distress as well. Yes. Yes. It took me a few weeks to really get over the exhaustion uh, that I had finishing up all my work after 35 years at the university and then taking an international flight 24 hours and so on. I was surprised, but I suppose part of it is my age. It took me a couple of weeks to get over that. Yeah. 
I have a body and I have a mind. It doesn't just disappear in a twinkle. But the point is the suffering, the dis-ease, this can be distinguished, needs to be clearly distinguished. Do you see? As I mentioned before, even when we're having a pleasurable experience, there's no pain. Already the seed of our dis-ease is there if there is clinging, if the self-delusion is there. That's the real suffering. Do you follow, Eckhart? Yes, I do. Yeah, the mind and the body is secondary. In, in the Far East, they don't make such a clear-cut distinction. Hmm? Actually, it, is a, it, it is a solution to accept wavering mind and um, unrest of mind, just to say, let it be. Just as you can learn to accept and embrace physical pain, if you have a bad knee or you have tight shoulders or a bad back. Hmm? Yes, we accept that. And there may be mental wavering as well. We don't need to become perfect human beings without ever having a thought. No, right? These things arise. Where do they come from? And where do they go to, Edward? Thank you. It's already resolved, isn't it? Huh? We don't need to create some ideal fantasy world. Huh? Hmm? Yes. One of the classic koans in the Blue Cliff Record huh? about uh, the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West, huh? the meaning of Zen, basically. Huh? There are literally hundreds and hundreds of answers to that question. But one that may be useful here is, after a long sitting, I'm tired. How about you? Is that Zenistic enough for you, Eggert? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Birgit. I uh, also have a question uh, cons I have to, to concerning the physical plane, the sitting. And um, is it desirable to find a posture, one posture that you sit through, or is it okay to change like every 25 minutes? I have like three postures. I kind of switch back and forth. Or would that be giving into the waver wavering thing. Mm -hmm. Is it more favorable to find one posture, one solid posture? Mm. It's good if you can to find one posture that really works. And at some point, just to sit through, forget the timer, throw out the clock when you have a whole day, just to sit as long as it takes until there's nothing, there's nowhere else to go. And then sit another 10 minutes just to make sure. And then get up and do what you need to do. But it is good to be able to have a posture solid enough so that you can sit for really an extended time. But practically speaking, practically speaking, it's helpful to have different postures. For example, The way I'm sitting now is the most comfortable to me, but sometimes I reverse the legs. Huh? I put the other one up, you follow? And that's not as comfortable for me, but I do that because always doing this can create too much tension in one side of the body, especially if you're sitting half lotus or quarter lotus, something like that. Naturally, the body is a little off to the side. So if you sit, for example, like this half lotus, it's good sometimes 
to alternate it with the other leg so that you're not always using one side. You follow? Yes. Practically speaking, that kind of balance can be helpful. Sometimes sitting in, in seiza, you know, with your legs sitting on your haunches like this. This can be very good for the breath, huh? sitting like this, huh? perhaps with a cushion in between. Huh? This can be very helpful too. But at one point, I think you'll find it's really helpful just to sit through. And when you're ready the, the, and you're settled in that, in that sitting, that posture is the best for you. Just sit through to the end, the end of yourself, not the end of some 50 minute period or something. And then, and then you'll know, and then you'll know. Make sure that it's settled and right. But from a day, for a day-to-day -day practice, when you're sitting a few hours, yeah, change it if you like, change it. Okay. okay, I think I mentioned, maybe it was in an earlier retreat, uh, the body, the, the human body, it seems, is not made just to sit still for really long periods of time. Anthropologists and other scientists have done studies and found, unlike some animals, human beings, the human body is not made just to sit still. That's why there are so many problems we have, not so much in Zazen, because we do take breaks and walk. But people who are sitting in their offices, and now almost everyone huh, is sitting in front of their computer, online work, huh? this creates problems. So you do need to get up and stretch sometimes too. The body needs that. But when you sit, give yourself fully to it. Does that help? Uh, yes. I was just wondering, because the, the changing of the positions, of course I do it uh, in order to avoid pain. So I was wondering if that's, mm -hmm. if that's okay to try to avoid pain. <laughs> We're not here to torture ourselves. Right. If there is some pain, try to see what you can do. The next sitting, adjust the cushion or something like that. We're not here to torture ourselves, but we're not here to make it as comfortable as possible either, because then what? You'll probably just fall asleep anyway. So we're not here to torture ourselves, but to find the right posture so that we can remain focused and clear for the work at hand, what is underfoot. Okay.